The reading for today's sermon comes from Joshua chapter 10, beginning at verse 16. These five kings fled and hid themselves in the cave at Makeda. And it was told to Joshua, the five kings have been found hidden in the cave at Makeda. And Joshua said, roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and set men by it to guard them. But not, do not stay there yourselves. Pursue your enemies, attack their rear guard. Do not let them enter their cities, for the Lord your God has given them into your hand. When Joshua and the sons of Israel had finished striking them with a great blow until they were wiped out, and when the remnant that remained of them had entered into the fortified cities, then all the people returned safe to Joshua in the camp at Makeda. Not a man moved his tongue against any of the people of Israel. Then Joshua said, Open the mouth of the cave and bring those five kings out to me from the cave. And they did so, and brought those five kings out to him from the cave, the kings of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And when they brought those kings out to Joshua, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war who had gone with him, Come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. Then they came near and put their feet on their necks. And Joshua said to them, Do not be afraid or dismayed, be strong and courageous, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And afterwards Joshua struck them and put them to death, and he hanged them on five trees. And they hung on the trees until evening. But at the time of the going down of the sun, Joshua commanded, and they took them down from the trees and threw them into the cave where they had hidden themselves. And they set large stones against the mouth of the cave, which remain to this very day. As for Makeda, Joshua captured it on that day and struck it and its king with the edge of the sword. He devoted to destruction every person in it. He left none remaining. And he did to the king of Makeda, just as he had done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him passed on from Makeda to Libna and fought against Libna. And the Lord gave it also and its king into the hand of Israel. And he struck it with the edge of the sword and every person in it. He left none remaining in it. And he did to its king as he'd done to the king of Jericho. Then Joshua and all Israel with him passed from there to Lachish and laid siege to it and fought against it. And the Lord gave Lachish into the hand of Israel and it captured it on the second day and struck it with the edge of the sword and every person in it as he had done to Libna. Then Horam, king of Giza, came up to help Lachish and Joshua struck him and his people until he left none remaining. Then Joshua and all Israel with him passed on from Lachish to Eglon and they laid siege to it and fought against it and they captured it on that day and struck it with the edge of the sword. And he devoted every person in it to destruction that day, as he had done to Lachish. Then Joshua and all Israel went up from Eglon to Hebron, and they fought against it, and captured it, and struck it with the edge of the sword, and its king, and its towns, and every person in it. He left none remaining, as he had done to Eglon, and devoted to destruction every person in it. Then Joshua and all Israel went with him, and turned back to Debir, and fought against it. And he captured it with its king, and all its towns. And they struck them with the edge of the sword and devoted to destruction every person in it. He left none remaining, just as he had done to Hebron and to Libna and its king, so he did to Debir and to its king. So Joshua struck the whole land, the hill country and the Negev and the lowland and the slopes and all their kings. He left none remaining, but devoted to destruction all that breathed, just as the Lord God of Israel commanded. And Joshua struck them from Kadesh Barnea as far as Gaza and all the country of Goshen as far as Gibeon. And Joshua captured all those kings and their land at that time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. Let's pray, shall we? Merciful Father, mighty living God, speak to us, we pray. Open our eyes that we may perceive wonderful things in your law and may be shaped by the Spirit to be more like the King, our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom it speaks. For we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat. Today, I would like to talk about eschatology. Eschatology is uh, sometimes... Uh, with some justification, thought of as the doctrine of the last things. From the Greek eschatos, as in eschatology, eschatos means last or final. And so people, when they hear eschatology, they think it's to do with things of the future, the second coming of Christ, or rather the final coming of Christ. 
uh, the last judgment, death, resurrection, heaven and hell and so on. And uh, eschatology is concerned with those things, but a better definition of the subject of eschatology would be to say that it is a Christian philosophy of the whole of history. Eschatology is about past, present and future. It's about the future because it's about everything. And so eschatology seeks to answer the question, what is it that God is doing in history in the creation that he has made? From the first day of creation all the way up to the final judgment of Christ and, of course, beyond. Now, most of the churches in our denomination, the Communion of Reformed Evangelical Churches, embrace an eschatological framework which is sometimes called post-millennialism. It's not actually an official position of our denomination, but I'm pretty sure that almost all, maybe I think there's one or two exceptions, of the sessions and the pastors in the denomination embrace this standpoint. Certainly, uh, Pastor Neil in the session here and I myself do. Post-millennialism, formally defined, is the claim that Christ will return in glory only after, that is post, the millennium. Hence, post-millennialism, right? It's not too difficult. Where the millennium is understood to be a long, not literal thousand years, but a long period of time during which Jesus reigns from heaven as he is doing now. It's this period of time in which we're living and the gospel spreads across the world as it's doing now and the church grows as it's doing now. And as that happens, society and the world and all human cultures will gradually be shaped to be more and more like the kingdom which is coming in its consummation. The prayer of the Lord's prayer your kingdom come on earth, is being answered and will be answered before Christ returns in glory. Hence, his return in glory will be post after that period of time. So the kingdom of God is growing and you think of biblical imagery like a seed which is sowed in the ground and produces a harvest 30, 60, 100 times what is sown, Mark 4. It's like the leaven that permeates through the whole loaf until all the loaf is leavened, Matthew 13. It's like the rock Daniel chapter 2, cut out, not by human hand, so it's like an altar, it's a holy rock, and it spreads and it grows and it becomes a mountain that fills the whole earth. And one day, Habakkuk chapter 2, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And then, 1 Corinthians 15, the end will come after Christ has subdued all rule and power and authority that is opposed to him. So, that's post-millennialism. That's a rough and brief introduction. That's three minutes. Loads of time left. Now, post-millennialism has loads of implications. Uh, for example, uh, it is not true that Jesus could return in glory at any time. That's not true. Because, as yet, the gospel hasn't subdued the whole world. You can look at corners of the world, like this little tiny corner of the world here, and say, well, this is Christian. But you couldn't really say the world is professedly Christian. And so Jesus can't and won't return until that moment, 1 Corinthians 15. He'll come, the end will come after he's subdued all the powers and authorities and institutions of life, public and private, that are opposed to him. And so he can't come back at any moment. That's a very common misconception among Bible-believing Christians. I used to think that. I was wrong. It's a long time ago, but uh, <laughs> I was nonetheless wrong. And, and the, the evangelical community in which um, I... Uh, was uh, blessed to be nurtured before going to seminary. Um, that was the standard view. It's not true. It's also true that the saved will vastly outnumber the lost. This is a point Benjamin Warfield made. Uh, because the kingdom will grow across the whole earth throughout history, as time passes, the church will accumulate more and more members. So in the end, when you get to the final day, and that's not counting all the unborn children, who the Lord is perfectly able graciously to save, even though their lives are taken from them before they even breathe their first breath. Um, Spurgeon, who was not post-millennial actually, Baptist in, in England, he thought that it was the case that God saves all infants who die at a young age or in the womb. I don't think that's necessarily true that God saves all, but he certainly could save all, and it's consistent with his mercy that he would save the vast majority and so it would be interesting to think, wouldn't it, on the first day of the new heavens and the new earth, what the population will look like before we've had, you know, 10 or 20 years to, to grow up and they're all kind of able to walk around. There's a thought. But that is not the most important practical implication of post-millennialism. 
What's most significant about post-millennial eschatology, and the reason why I want to talk about it today, is that it has implications for the shape of the history in which we're now living. It tells us what kinds of things we ought to do now. It's a philosophy of history, not just of things that haven't happened yet. Let me illustrate. Let's imagine for a second that you and your family and a few hundred friends, like let's imagine just us, let's imagine that we were just um, uh, shipwrecked, it's hard to imagine, this is even harder to imagine, and marooned on a vast and apparently deserted continent. Right? There you are, shipwrecked on the beach, all bedraggled, covered in sand and a bit tired and wondering what do we do now? And that's the question, what do we do now? Now what you do now depends on when or whether and how you expect to be rescued. If you expect to be rescued any day now, then what would you do? Well, I mean, your focus would basically be on staying alive, right? <laughs> Pick berries, eat coconuts, I don't know what the, this vast, unpeopled continent would be like, but there wouldn't be much reason to leave the coastline, would there, and go inland. You just keep a, a lookout for passing ships because you're expecting one to come past at any moment and whisk you away to another place which will be your home, so you don't really have to worry about this vast deserted continent on which we and our friends have been marooned, right? But let's imagine option two. Imagine if you knew for a fact that nobody is coming for thousands of years. This is your new home. And when they do come, they're not going to whisk you away, take you somewhere else. When somebody comes, it's going to be the king of that continent who you're actually under the authority of now. And he's not going to take you away. He's going to move in with you. That's a very different picture. That's a different philosophy of history, isn't it? It means that what you would do now is, well, uh, let's get busy building. Let's get busy creating structures that will long outlast our lives. Let's, let's build schools and hospitals and buildings and social structures and uh, families and relationships that will endure for thousands of years so that when the king returns... He will say, well done, good and faithful servant. You did a good job of anticipating my return. Not thinking that, thank goodness, I can be whisked off someplace else and this doesn't, it's all going to burn, so don't worry about it. But moving in here. You see, those two philosophies of history, option one, whisked away any day now, option two, build for thousands of years, give you very different paradigms for how we should live in the meantime, don't they? Now, it won't surprise you, having just described post-millennialism, to hear that option two is the biblical picture of history. We are indeed marooned on a vast continent. We're not alone. And we are expecting someday the king to return. And when he returns, he's not whisking us away anywhere. He'll renew and recreate us and aspects of the structures around us. But this is the place where he is going to move into visibly, bodily, gloriously, forever with us. So get busy. Build for the long-term future. That's why post-millennial eschatology is so practically significant, because what it means is, and this is what, I, as I think about our denomination, this is, this is the CREC at its best. When it lives out this conviction, this glorious recognition that Jesus, when he comes, is not going to take us away someplace else so that this world doesn't matter. What's going to happen is he's going to move in so that our lives should be about building for the future. We should be interested in building long-term educational institutions. We should be in investing in the transformation of our communities, knowing that one person, one person to whom we can reach out and snatch from the fire or from the chaos of a dissolute and ungodly life could be the mother of thousands of generations of people who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ is when business owners devote themselves, not just to their business, but they've done reasonably well, they can help other people. I had a wonderful conversation today with a Christian man who's uh, he's been tremendously blessed by the Lord and, uh, uh, in financial terms and in lots of other ways. And uh, His business recently changed, it was bought out, and he started a couple of new things, and one of the things he's doing is mentoring young Christian CEOs. I thought that was tremendous, because what it shows is his sense of the value of building these structures for people. If you're thinking of joining All Saints, and there are one or two people here who are not members, and one or two people who've just joined, and like you're stuck with us now, but there are a few of you here who you're not sure whether you, what you think of this crowd. Um, this is what we're all about. 
This is what we're all about. Uh, in, a, in a few minutes, I'll talk about um, some of our problems as a denomination, and you need to know about them, because if you're going to join us, you need to know what we do wrong. But um, this is what we aspire to. This is what we aspire to be. Those who seek in faithful obedience to Jesus Christ to build for the long term. Now, a comprehensive defense of post-millennialism would be rather complex. Uh, it would involve us in lots of detail. And uh, please don't Google it, ever. Uh, I, I try just to see what would happen. And I, I estimate that roughly 5% of the websites that were returned had an accurate description of post-millennial eschatology. The other 95% were full of all kinds of misunderstandings and ignorance and misrepresentation, just like you'd expect. Like a 5% hit rate on the internet is really quite good, I think. But that doesn't mean that that's, you know, you should, you should read books, like stop reading online things. Lorraine Bettner, Keith Matheson, um, uh, Ken Gentry, they've all written very good, detailed, thoughtful books on this subject if you want to read them. But fortunately, there are texts of Scripture which can help us, and Joshua chapter 10 is one of them. Joshua chapter 10 is one of many texts of Scripture which illuminate this aspect of the Bible's teaching. And having sketched in outline what a post-millennial eschatology entails, I now want to spend the rest of our time uh, exploring what this chapter has to say about it. It has three main themes. Um, uh, the conquest is led by Joshua, the conquest involves all the people, and the conquest proceeds gradually. And each of these themes um, uh, reflects priorities and characteristics of the church and of the kingdom of God, which Jesus is building now. You know this because the book of Joshua is written for this purpose. It's showing us how Israel conquered the land, and therefore it's showing the church how we should seek to live to grow or be agents of the growth of Christ's kingdom in the world. So, and I was looking through my notes this morning, and I realized to my horror that the third point is not the shortest. So if, if it just gets a bit much, I've got my stopwatch going, uh, just wave and I'll stop. But um, otherwise, I'm just going to carry on until I'm finished, and we'll see where we get to. I uh, hope you brought your lunch with you. Anyway, um, so first up, the first thing that this passage highlights for us, which is of tremendous importance for understanding Christian eschatology, is that the conquest is led by Joshua. Very straightforward. Look with me. Um, you see this really strong focus on Joshua throughout this section. I didn't count the number of times his name appears, but look, verse 16. These five kings, that's from last week, the five kings who, who joined forces to fight against Gibeon, and then Joshua went to defend them with the people of Israel. They fled and hid. Well, there we are. And it was told, verse 17, to Joshua. It's like, we've got to tell Joshua he's the guy in charge. Uh, and then Joshua said, right, okay, well, here's what to do. You've got to roll these stone, stones against it to the mouth of the cave so they can't escape. Then you go and chase after everybody else. And then verse 22, skip down to the next paragraph. It's Joshua who issues the instructions. Look with me, verse 22. Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring these five kings out to me from there. And they did so and brought those five kings out to him from the cave. You see how the, the phrasing is exactly mirrored. It's how Hebrew narratives indicate obedience do this, yada, 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 and he did this, yada, yada, yada. And, it's ex and so everyone's doing what Joshua says because Joshua's in charge. You see, Joshua is being depicted as the great leader whom the people of Israel must follow. Verse um, 23, uh, oh, we read that already. Oh, yes, and they did so and brought those five kings out to him from the cave, the kings of, king of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon. Notice there's five kings and just one man, Joshua, who's not even a king. So who's going to win? Well, we already know, because Joshua is the great leader of the people of God. Joshua speaks for God. Joshua leads the people towards their divinely appointed destiny. In verse 24, when they brought those kings out to Joshua, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel. You see, he's the guy in charge. In verse 25, Joshua said to them, this is a fascinating moment, do not be afraid or dismayed, be strong and courageous. Where have you heard that before? Well, you all know where you've heard that before. It's in Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1, the Lord says to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Here in Joshua chapter 10, Joshua speaks for God. He's the one given the words with which to lead the people of Israel, the divine words to speak. And verse 26, Joshua struck them and put them to death and hanged them on five trees. And then at the end of verse 27, when the sun was ready to go down, Joshua commanded and they took them down from the trees and threw them into the cave and so on. He says, Joshua, 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 and then verse 28, as for Makeda, well, that's the city that the, one of the kings was from. Joshua struck that city. It's just see how he focuses on this man the whole way through. Actually, in, in verses 29 to the end, you have a description of, it's a telescoped summary of a long period of time. Come to that later. 
um, during which all the major cities of the southern part of Canaan are conquered. I won't go through each of them. Uh, there are seven in total, including Makeda. Well, that's obvious why that is, isn't it? It's a, a historical description of what happened, and at the same time, seven cities. And seven is a reminder of the creation in Genesis chapter 1, when in six days plus one, seven, God created the world and rested. So seven is like a picture of the whole Canaanite created order, subdued under the feet of Joshua. And you get to the end, so chapter 10, verse 40. So who is it who struck the whole land? You see, Joshua, Joshua, Joshua struck the whole land. He left none remaining. Verse 41, Joshua struck them from Kadesh Barnea as far as Gaza. Kadesh Barnea is um, southeast. Gaza is northwest. And then where do we get to? Um, Goshen as far as Gibeon. Goshen is southwest, a long way southwest, back in Egypt and Gibeon is northeast. So the, the, the map draws like this square, here to here and here to here. The whole area of the south of Canaan is struck by Joshua. And verse 42, Joshua captured all these kings at that, and their land at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. So if only we could find a king, preferably one whose name is Joshua, <laughs> who could fight for us, through whom the Lord Yahweh, the God of Israel, fights, then we'd be okay, wouldn't we? Because then we'd know what to do. And the, the, the most basic and fundamental uh, point that needs to be grasped about Christian eschatology is that it is Jesus who fights for his people. It is Joshua, same name, who fights for his people. In fact, sometimes the allusions in New Testament texts are so explicit that they really can't be missed. There's one example here in the text that I read in verse 24, uh, come and put your feet on the necks of these kings. That's alluded to specifically in 1 Corinthians 15 which is also quoting Psalm 110, which also alludes to this. So Psalm 110 is the most quoted Old Testament text anywhere in the New Testament. Um, he will put his enemies under his feet. And Jesus is the one who will put all his enemies under his feet. 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus is the one who leads the conquest of the world. Jesus is, he is the one whom we must follow. It really is as simple as that. And it's particularly intriguing then when you look at verse 26. How many of you noticed something odd about verse 26? And verse 27 as well. Have you, have you seen things like this elsewhere in the Bible? Let me just read it to you again. Joshua struck them and put them to death and hanged them on five trees. Hmm, kings hanging on trees? And they hung there on the trees till the evening, but at the time of the going down of the sun, Joshua commanded and they took them down from the trees. So kings hanging on the trees taken down in the evening, verse 27, and then where, where are their bodies put? Oh, in a cave. <laughs> and then there's a stone rolled over the cave. But can you think of anywhere else in the Bible where a king is hanging on a tree, taken down at evening, put in a cave, and the stone is put in place? Duh. Yeah, it's Jesus. Which is astonishing, isn't it? Because it tells you the one crucial, crucial difference between what's going on in Joshua chapter 10 and what's going on in uh, Jesus chapter 2022, which is that Jesus the king has been hanged on the tree. Jesus the king was taken down at evening so as to avoid offending the religious sensibilities of his executioners. Jesus was thrown in a cave and Jesus had the stone rolled over there because Jesus would rather die himself than put the kings of the earth to death. I mean, it's true, there will come a day when all those kings of the earth who refuse to kiss the sun will be shattered into pieces like bits of broken pottery, Psalm 2. Right? That day is coming, but that day is not yet. That day is not yet. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the day where Jesus the King conquers the nations by laying down his life for them in this wonderful, glorious, gospel-shaped anti-picture of what Joshua is doing in chapter 10. In Joshua, you see what's happened is like the final judgment has come on Canaan. Remember I mentioned that before, like a few months ago? Joshua is the moment of final judgment on the land of Canaan. But before that day comes, our king Joshua has been hanged on a tree so that the kings of the earth may join him rather than being crushed by him. And what that does is highlights the significance of the second thing that I want to highlight uh, for you um, as we're thinking about Joshua chapter 10, which is that though the conquest is led by Joshua, it's not just Joshua. And you would have seen uh, many times in that chapter as we looked, um, uh, read through it earlier, 
is Joshua and all Israel. Did you notice that? So it's not just, oh, the church is going to chill out and sit back, relax, put your feet up, and watch Jesus conquer the nations. Right? When, he's, when the Lord is pleased to convert the heathen, he'll do so without your help or mine. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> Bizarrely, the Lord has chosen to involve us in his purposes. Just like Joshua. It's really interesting, isn't it, how he summoned those um, uh, men of the people of Israel, put your feet on their necks. Isn't that wonderful? And even at the climax in verse 43, Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgal. It's like Joshua, the triumphant king, welcomes his people to come and rest with him. So the people of Israel are also involved in, and in fact, what actually happens is um, Joshua gives the victory to Israel. Come here, you guys. You put your feet on their necks. You be the ones who conquer. Or, you be the ones who proclaim the message of grace to the nations. You be the one who tells the kings of the earth and all their subjects that either they could be hanged on a tree and thrown in a cave, or they can come to the one who has done for him. Now, we integrate this, then, with our picture of how the rest of the Bible teaches um, the details of this subject. You start to see it everywhere. So, for example, let me give you a couple of uh, instances where you see that Christ conquers with and through and for his people. The whole book of Acts is about this. In Acts chapter 1, um, Luke, who's the author of the book of Acts, uh, Luke wrote, Luke volume 1 is the gospel of Luke, Luke volume 2 is the book of Acts. He begins it by saying, in my first book, O Theophilus, that's the book of Luke, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. And so, what is the book of Acts about? Well, it's clearly about all that Jesus continued to do and to teach. And, and often people think, oh, no, the, the book of Acts is the, is, so Luke is about what Jesus did, Acts is about what the church did. No. <laughs> Luke is about what Jesus did when he was phys- here physically on earth. Acts is about what the church did, sorry, what Jesus continued. See, I even might make that mistake. Acts is about what Jesus continues to do in his bodily absence, where the only body he has on earth is the church. Oh, and that. It's Jesus who continues his ministry. You see the same thing in, Acts, in um, the book of Daniel. One of the most vivid depictions of this, in um, uh, Daniel chapter 7, there's this fourfold vision of the whole of human history from uh, the ancient um, uh, Persian Empire all the way through to the coming of the kingdom of God in the first century. And in the first instance, it's in the form of a vision. You've got four beasts, remember? Lion, bear, leopard, and then the scary beast that nobody really knows how to describe, but it's like really scary. Um, and the four beasts are four kingdoms. And then after the, four beast, the fourth beast is destroyed, uh, verse 13, there comes one like a son of man. Well, it's obviously Jesus. He comes to the Ancient of Days and is welcomed into the presence of the living God. So that's the ascension of Christ. And to him, Jesus, is given dominion and glory and a kingdom and all patient peoples and nations and languages should serve him. So you get to halfway through Daniel chapter 7 and you know that this vision is about all nations, all peoples, all languages worshipping and serving Jesus who's enthroned at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Yes? And then you get to the interpretation of the vision. You think, oh, this will be fairly straightforward. And it is. It seems fairly straightforward. Well-ish for the book of Daniel, I suppose. But then you get to verse 27 and the kingdom and the dominion and of the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given not to the Son of Man, but to the people of the saints of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey them. So whose is the kingdom? Well, it's Jesus's, which is to say that it belongs to his saints. You see? It's for the saints that Christ works through the saints. So the kingdom is given to the church. Uh, the, the kingdom grows through the ministry of the church as we seek to be like Christ to the nations. Now, you bring these two things together. You bring this vital priority of our serving the kingdom, which really is to say serving the king, and you bring it together with the picture that we've already got of how Jesus does it. How does Jesus do it exactly? Well, Jesus conquers by being hanged on a tree, which is to say, 
being publicly disgraced, being accused before every eye of a crime he hasn't committed. He's humiliated, he's deprived of justice, he's taken down before sunset so that the, the cultural and religious leaders of the day can say that they are serving justice, they are serving righteousness, they are serving goodness, they are doing what is right because we took him down before sunset. And so what are we supposed to do? Well, it, it's a challenge, isn't it? Are, are we ready to conquer in the way that the king does? Are we ready to experience public disgrace? Are we ready to be unjustly criticised? Are we ready to be humiliated? Are we ready to be deprived of justice? Ironically, by people who claim to be embodying the values of our God. Because only by doing that will we actually be exemplifying Christ's mode of conquest. It's interesting. I, I, I've noted in the last few weeks and months a growing debate. You may have spotted this online, sorry. Um, about how Christians should uh, seek to engage with a, an increasingly hostile secular culture. It's, it's actually been, uh, uh, it's had a new life, if that's the right term, <laughs> breathed into it by uh, Aaron Wren's now quite well-known taxonomy, negative world, neutral, sorry, positive world, negative world. Let me try and get it right. Okay, give me one more try, one more try okay? Positive world, neutral world, negative world. There we are. Hold your applause. Thank you. That's okay. Well, what, remember what he says is, what, go back before 1990-something or 1980-something, and, and you're in a world where being a Christian is a positive thing, viewed as a positive thing. Then you enter a, a period of time from about 1994 onwards when being a Christian is seen as a neutral thing, and then after 2014 or something, it's now seen as a negative thing. And, and more or less, most people recognize that there's something in that, um, even though they might put the dates differently and say, well, it's different in different parts of the country, which obviously it is, you know. It's just a kind of a broad taxonomy. But what's happened is um, younger, politically active, reformed Christians have started to point the finger at people whose ministry and, and lives stretch back to the era, era of the neutral world or the positive world, and they've started to say, and I quote one of them, the time for civility is over. We're no longer in the positive world. It is no longer appropriate, and it's certainly no longer going to be effective, to try and engage in an irenic sort of gracious way with people who are, they now hate you. Right? That's how the argument runs. And it's just really interesting, because um, on the one hand, I want to say, well, yeah, absolutely. Obviously, we're in a context where Christians and Christian ways of life are being increasingly critiqued and censured in public life, often in quite self-righteous terms by uh, hostile, anti-Christian, social, political, cultural movements. Yeah, right, true. But why does it follow from that that the time for civility is over? It's just really intriguing to me. I don't understand why. And notice the logic. that The world is becoming more hostile, so we should be less polite. It just doesn't make sense. Unless you've already embraced the prior conviction that really what we need to do is mirror the world. The world's going on the offensive, it's time for us to go on the offensive. The world is being hostile, let's get hostile. The world's being aggressive and shrill and angry, let's get aggressive. Let's get shrill, let's get angry. <laughs> like, once you put it like that, you realise how foolish it is, don't you? Now obviously there is a time. There's always been a time for denun denouncing the wickedness of sin. I mean, you notice most of Jesus' critiques are directed within the people of God. Like, almost every prophetic denunciation, there are oracles against the nations, there are some exceptions, granted. But it's interesting where the focus lies, they're directed against the people of God. Somehow we have turned the, the secular God-hating world into a model for our public theology at precisely the point where we are saying they have become most anti-Christian. <laughs> Bizarre. How do we ever make that conclusion? Uh, I've got to say, let, let's, be, let's be upfront about it. Let's be honest. This, this is, I've already told you where I think the CRC is at its best. And note, 
uh, I brought my family 5,000 miles across the ocean so I could serve in this denomination. I love this denomination. I love these people. I go to presbytery meetings, and they're nothing like what I thought presbytery meetings would be. They're encouraging. <laughs> they're enjoyable. <laughs> it's a delight. What an honor to serve alongside other fellow ministers and men like that, and to know men and women and young people in the con What a delight. But let's be honest, what are we like at our worst? What are we are uh, new reformed bumper sticker theology. Who remembers bumper sticker Christianity? Remember that? Like wait, what you'd have is you'd have people who would parade on their car bumpers cheap slogans. Yeah, Jesus loves you. Well, yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, or they, sometimes you get um, really toe-curling attempts at humour, like um, God answers knee mail. <laughs> knee as in, don't, don't worry about it, it's really, it's not funny. You know, that's all, and, and it's interesting, because it, like, those things are sort of true in as far as they go, aren't they? But notice what's happening. It's, the reason those things are so embarrassing to look back on is because they were really an attempt in so many cases to portray Christian convictions without sacrifice, without the costly pain of involvement in the lives of other suffering and sinful human beings. They were just like a bumper sticker. And they were nice bumper stickers and funny bumper stickers because, you know, positive world, but now we're in negative world. So what do our bumper stickers look like now? Right. Can you see what, what's happened? We are in danger of, and the problem is not the stickers, right? The problem is the, the underlying logic where we've been so captured by the spirit of the age and that the world is full of an angry, progressive, anti-Christian God-haters, so we'd better get out there and tell them what we think of them. You, you know where you see this most um, clearly, I think, and we're certainly going to see it in the next few months? It's in the uh, pro-life, anti-abortion movement. Let's be as honest and upfront about this as we can. We are going to see a huge upsurge, we are seeing it already, in uh, rhetoric from both sides of the Roe v. Wade debate in the com current months, correct? And that means that what we're going to see is the texture that exists within the Christian pro-life movement. And it's fascinating to hear how some Christians speak about, and in some cases, to men and women who are entering abortion clinics. And the anger and the fierceness of the rhetoric which is directed <coughs> against them. Now, it's really interesting to think about this, isn't it? Because what would be the grounds for doing that? Well, the grounds would be God speaks in such forceful and, at times, spitting with rage ways about those who exploit the weak, about those who crush the oppressed, about those who don't care for the orphan. So. You know, you can imagine the logic, can't you? The logic runs like this. God declares in venomous and aggressive terms his implacable hostility to this wickedness directed against the vulnerable. Therefore, we should declare in similar terms our hostility to this wicked. Well, this is <laughs> let me illustrate this. Um, imagine an uh, exasperated mother saying to her four or five children, listen, please, would you just keep your rooms tidy? At which point, two-year-old daughter goes and grabs a pair of mum's high heels, puts them on, potters around like this, declaring to her brothers and sisters, please, will you keep your bedrooms tidy? It's like, what are you doing? Oh, well, that's what mum said. So, no, 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 you don't understand, sweetie. The reason mum said that is because she wants you to keep your bedroom tidy. She's not, this isn't a model for your public engagement with your siblings. It's, an, it's a, an exhortation that is designed to inculcate the values that drive it. The reason, the reason why God denounces the wickedness of the world and the oppression of the weak with such intensity is because he wants us to care for the weak. Can you see that? He doesn't, like I said, caveat, of course there is a time 
for calling a spade a spade, as we used to say back in England. Maybe even say that in Texas. But it's just fascinating, isn't it, how much easier and, frankly, much more common it is to see the relatively cost-free rhetorical response, bumper sticker, than it is to see the actual costly investment in the lives of the people who, as well as being sinners, and of course they're sinners, like, duh, of course they're sinners, are also victims of their own foolishness and self-destructiveness. So the conquest involves the people of Israel, and they're called to do it in the way that their Joshua does it. Which leads us to the uh, third point, which I will try and squeeze a little bit. But let me talk about this for a moment or two. The conquest is led by Joshua, it involves the people of Israel, and you notice it proceeds gradually. Well, perhaps you didn't notice, but you would, or you will if I show you. Look with me at verse 40, and I'll show you what I mean. In verse 40, at the climax of this section, uh, it says, quote, Joshua struck the whole land, the hill country and the Negev and the lowland and the slopes and all their kings. He left none remaining, but devoted to destruction all that breathed, just as the Lord God of Israel had commanded. And then you've got the verse 41, north, south, east, west. Uh, verse 42, Joshua captured all the, those kings of that and their land at one time. And then he returns to Gilgal. Then you turn over the page. Look with me at chapter 13, verse 1. Now, Joshua was old and advanced in years... And the Lord said to him, you're old and advanced in years. Yeah, thanks for rubbing it in, Lord. I'm just <laughs> grateful for that. And there remains very much land to possess. Very strange. In chapter 11, we've, or 10, and the beginning of 11, we've got this affirmation that the job's done. In chapter 13, it's like, it's not done. Well, why is that? Well, the reason is, it's not, as some scholars say, that you've got two contradictory traditions which some incompetent editor has just slapped together to make the book of Joshua. Come on. Uh, it's actually because what you've got in chapter 10 and in the first half of chapter 11 is a summary of a very long period of history, all squeezed together. So that at the end of that period, yes, there's the, the land is mostly subdued, but, and there were times probably when it looked like the enmity to the Lord and his ways and his people had been subdued, but it, what, it didn't happen all in one go. Quite the contrary. In fact, chapter 11, um, verse... Uh, 18, it says explicitly, Joshua made war for a long time with all those kings. And that's not just the northern Canaanite kings, it's the southern Canaanite kings. Now, what's going on here? The reason, uh, it, well, this, this, this was actually explicitly predicted. If you turn back to uh, Deuteronomy 7, um, verse 22, it tells the Israelites how long it's going to take for them to conquer the land. It says, the Lord your God will clear away these nations before you little by little. You may not make an end of them all at once lest the wild beasts grow too numerous for you. And similarly, in verses, uh, chapter, uh, Exodus, sorry, Exodus 23, 29 and 30, little by little I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and possessed the land. Now this is a critically important observation, really, historical observation. The Lord does not, in one fell swoop, drive out all the Canaanites from the land and then say to the people of Israel, right, you go ahead and walk in and fill it. Well, practically speaking, Deuteronomy 7, there'll be lions and bears and stuff everywhere. They couldn't control the land. Uh, and Exodus 23, they haven't yet grown to fill it. In other words, put in more abstract terms, the people of Israel have not yet put in place the structures of life necessary to ensure the ongoing faithful governance of this vast territory. And only as they start to put those structures in place will the Lord allow them to conquer the land. So chapter 10 is a gradual summary of what they gradu a long-term summary of what they gradually did. And if they keep being faithful, if they keep building these structures in a faithful way, then the Lord gradually will give them the land. You see it elsewhere in Scripture, actually. You find it in um, the book of Haggai. You know, you build the Lord's house first. You do that. And then the Lord will put an end to the drought. Yeah? Malachi, you start tithing, and then see if the Lord won't open the, the windows of heaven and pour out his blessing upon you. You don't wait for the Lord to give you the thing and then think, right, now what are we going to do with this? So, in concrete historical terms, in the, in the age in which we now live, it forces us to address this question. Like, what, 
why has the Lord not given us the land? And the answer is very simple. We lack the structures, uh, the institutions, and frankly, the history of long-term faithfulness to be ready to govern. Can you imagine what it would be like if overnight the Christian church in America was given political power? Lord, preserve us. There we are. So what is our task? Our task is to build. Those who've shown themselves faithful with ten talents will be given ten cities. It's not, Lord, give me the cities, and then I'll have a look at these talents thing, and we'll see what we can work out. You see? So we are called, therefore, to build families and churches and institutions to to work to care for the poor. You look after one uh, pregnant 17-year-old whose abusive boyfriend has vanished to find somebody else who doesn't want to get rid of the baby but just doesn't know what to do. You look after one, well, then maybe that's one talent. We prove ourselves faithful with one person. Then maybe, in the next generation or two, the Lord will give us one city. Maybe. The Lord can do in five or ten or twenty years far more than we can imagine. But thank the Lord, he won't give us that for which we've not shown ourselves faithful. Little by little, as you show yourself faithful, I will drive them out from before you. So the conquest proceeds gradually. It will proceed if we approach it in a Christ-like fashion, because then Jesus will be leading us. Let's pray together. Merciful Father, we thank you that Jesus is the King, and we ask for the disposition of long-term commitment and faithfulness, which in truth we need to show ourselves ready to rule with him. And so work in us, we pray, in the day-to-day of our jobs and our family life and our relationships with one another and with other people. Work in us so that we start to exhibit that faithfulness that your word calls for. And work graciously by your spirit through us, we pray, to do more than we could ask or imagine. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.